The brain worms in Baldur's Gate 3 are a great idea. We're going to talk about why and how you might steal them for your own home game. Hey everybody, Matt Colby here. I've been playing a lot of Baldur's Gate 3, a lot of Baldur's Gate 3, and while there are some choices they make that really, really piss me off, the overall experience is so positive, I think it might be the best game I've ever played. That's sort of a crazy thing to say. I mean, how do I compare what I think and feel now about Baldur's Gate 3 with how I felt when I was 30 and Halo first came out? How do I compare the hours I put into this solo RPG with the even more intense hours I put into StarCraft or League of Legends? It's very much apples and oranges, but I can say with all honesty that it feels like the best game I've ever played, and I think that's because I know how hard what they're doing is. I am a dungeon master and I'm a game developer. I have written and recorded dialogue for AAA games. I have designed adventures for my D&D campaign and missions in video games. So the triumph of Baldur's Gate 3 is a lot clearer to me, a lot more impressive than if I were just some random gamer who picked this over Armored Core 6 or whatever. I know more than most how hard what they're trying to do is. There's a lot to talk about with this game, but the first thing that struck me as being a really brilliant piece of design, very useful to us as game masters, is the worms, the brain worms. This isn't a spoiler, it is literally the first thing that happens in the game. But in case you haven't played Baldur's Gate 3 yet, here's the hook. Your PC is a random idiot in the city of Baldur's Gate, who is the victim of a large scale alien abduction. A giant interdimensional squid ship, interdimensional squid ships, very popular, attacks the city and kidnaps hundreds of random people before flying off into the void again. You are one of the people kidnapped, along with a collection of incredibly random but level appropriate heroes in the city. Now, this is a very good opening hook for any D&D game, and it's probably obvious why, but in case it's not, it's super cool for a couple of reasons. First, it clearly establishes who the bad guys are. Mind flayers, everybody loves these guys. They're one of D&D's best enemies iconic. And almost as soon as the ship kidnaps you, it crashes. All the mind flayers are dead, or you know, uh, close enough to death that it is safe for a first level party to poke them without worrying about your brains exploding. Those of you who've been watching these videos forever may recognize this design. We put the campaign ending villains, the epic bad guys we're going to spend the next 12 levels getting ready to fight, we're going to put them right in front of the players at first level when the heroes are too feeble to do anything about it. But then the ship crashes, it kills all the squid dudes. So what does it all mean? The ship kidnaps random people from Baldur's Gate. So you can make any character with any personality, backstory, motivation, and there's a reason for you to be in the party. You know, the classic reluctant hero who sits in the shadows at the back of the inn and talks like Batman and needs to be convinced to go on the adventure because he works alone. Yeah, well, sorry, Batman, the squid dudes got you and you are on the adventure, whether you like it or not. And that can be fun. That I never signed up for this hero can be fun to play. And this setup gives you a reason to be the classic reluctant hero. Then it shows you the bad guys, mind flayers. Now we know who our enemies are. We don't know why they're kidnapping people, but with mind flayers, it's not weird that this is happening. It's not like you got kidnapped by the Muppets and everyone was wondering why the hell Kermit the Frog and Big Bird are torturing people. No, we expect Mind Flayers to do this stuff. And even though we don't know exactly why they're doing this specific evil thing here and now, it is definitely in their wheelhouse. It's their vibe. We're only on the ship for a minute before it crashes. So we get to see the Mind Flayers and we get to see them doing evil stuff, but there's nothing we can do about it. Then we escape before things get too hairy. This is... It's really good. Kidnapped prisoners of the Mind Flayers, so we get to see them being evil up close, but then the ship crashes before they can eat our brains. It's always good to show the players what the bad guys can do. Show us the villain being villainous, especially when we can't do anything about it. That makes it worse. And now we look forward to doing something about it. So brilliant opening gives us a great reason for very different characters to all be on this ship, sets up some high level epic villains, but not in a way that gets the entire party killed at first level. It's very efficient, very efficient, very cinematic. This game commits at least one major sin I, I sort of can't forgive, but it does not commit the classic video game sin of using cinematics to do the least cinematic thing possible and have people monologuing at you. They're called movies, folks. 
not explainies. And can I just stop and praise this game for something brilliant? Those of you who watched my Twitch streams already know about this, but one of the things that I think makes a work art and not just a product, like a Twinkie, is when the authors steal time away from the producers. Something that immediately raises a work of art, in my estimation, is when the game steals some time away from the money people to show us something, not advance the plot, not ratchet up the tension, not an action scene with conflict, just put the camera on a moment and let it happen. Give it time. The people paying for the movie or the game or whatever, they hate this shit. I cannot tell you how many games I worked on where the money people wanted to cut something, something amazing, not because no one would see it, but because not everyone would see it in one playthrough. Well, Baldur's Gate sure as shit doesn't have that problem. I am pretty cynical when it comes to games like this because CRPGs tend to view writing the way the Academy Awards view acting. It's not the best, but it's definitely the most. Well, I knew I was in for something special when, as the interdimensional squid ship is crashing, the ship tilts nauseatingly and everyone starts sliding across the deck plates and people start flying out the windows. And my character slams into a wall right next to this portal, right? I almost just fell to my death, but just by sheer luck, I slammed into the bulkhead instead, inches away from the hole in the side of the ship. And as my character is sitting there, sweating, bleeding, the wind whipping around my hair from the rapid, unplanned descent, the camera cuts to the other side of the hole in the hull. And just like me, there's a mind flare also pressed up against the bulkhead. And we just look at each other across the gap. Enemies a second ago, now just two victims of fate. Neither of us in control, neither of us has any illusion of control. This alien being of near godlike power who was trying to eat my brains a second ago, and me, whoever I thought I was, whatever kind of hero I thought I had made, on this ship, I was basically a lab rat. The two of us are now, for this one moment in time, equals. Nothing is said, there's no dialogue, thank God. And you can imagine that both of these characters believe they're about to die, but for this one moment, they're alive. And in that moment, everything else is forgotten. All either of us wants is somehow to stretch this moment out forever, for a lifetime. Because whatever else is true, in that brief instant, we are both alive and safe, safe from each other, safe from the crashing ship. It's moving, it's poetic, and I think it's real. I think that's the kind of real life that can and should happen in fantasy. In real world tragedies, there must be moments like that. How often has a dying person desperately wished to stretch out a single moment into an eternity? Won't that eventually happen to all of us? Anyway, it's really good, y'all. The game continues after that, and we are not killed by the crashing ship. We are saved by a mysterious benefactor which we don't need to get into, we are deposited onto a beach and left to fend for ourselves amidst the wreckage and meet our future teammates. And here's the second brilliant thing about the opening setup. While we were all in the squid ship, the Mind Flayers were all watching Star Trek II. It's their favorite movie. I don't blame them. Squid dudes got good taste. And they watched the bit where the guy from Fantasy Island sticks little baby sandworms in everybody's ears. Well, the squid dudes all look at each other and they stop munching on their brain-flavored popcorn long enough to go, brainworms, brilliant, let's have some of that. So, we all have brainworms. All of the PCs in Baldur's Gate, and I think of all the people you can recruit into your party as being PCs of other players, all the PCs in Baldur's Gate. Actually, literally as I am writing this, something just occurred to me. I haven't finished this game, so I have no idea how it ends, but... If I were writing it, I would have one PC reveal that they never had brain worms and they were an agent of the Mind Flayers this whole time. A free agent of the bad guys. Well, we'll see. But until then, no spoilers. Until then, we all have brain worms and the worms are awesome for two reasons. First, the obvious reason, they force a bunch of different characters to work together. This is awesome. Now, for us, as directors, this is only a value if we want to run a game featuring characters who would normally not work together. 
This is that pitching your game thing we talked about before. There's no, there's no virtue in running a game in which the characters are a mix of heroes and villains and whatever's in between, and they would normally be at each other's throats, but you invented some contrivance to force them to work together. Running the Suicide Squad or the Dirty Dozen is not inherently better than any other D&D game. That's down to taste. But if you and your friends think that it would be cool to have that kind of dynamic, and it is about the dynamic, right? It, it, it's not about playing the cold-blooded, unfeeling assassin. It's about being forced to confront those awful choices that you made in the past, because now you're stuck in this party with other people who make you think about those things in ways maybe you hadn't before. That's the first thing the brain worms do. They allow us to mix a bunch of characters together who would normally hate each other. But we all got the worms. We all got to work together or our heads explode. It's the we hate each other, but we have to work together thing that is the hook. Not the, oh cool, now I get to play an asshole and piss off my friends with a good excuse. No, the point is the interaction between these characters and the way they develop as a result. So that's what you gotta pitch to your players if you wanna do something like this. Do you like the idea of playing characters with questionable pasts? Characters who would normally hate each other, but who are going to have to learn to rely on each other? You need player buy-in, otherwise this won't work. I mean, maybe you've been playing with the same group for 20 years and you, you know that they will like this, that's fine. But as a rule, this kind of campaign works better if everyone knows what they're getting into and they are excited by it. But the worms do more than just force random weirdos to work together. They present a ton of amazing opportunities for role-playing in what would otherwise be combat scenarios. Because the presence of the Star Trek II worm in your brain marks you as a member of the Cult of the Squid Dudes. So this means you can infiltrate the Cult of the Squid Dudes. Super awesome. There are so many amazing moments that suddenly open up when you can use the brain worms to pass as a cultist. You can check out their stronghold, learn their plans, but you're always worried. Will they realize I'm not really in the cult? Will they ask me to do something horrible to prove I'm with them. How do I feel about that? How far am I willing to go? And what if it turns out you are like them? You like using this power. What if that's something you discover about yourself as you play? The problem isn't the cult. The problem is I'm not in charge. So that's just, it's amazing. It is a great implementation of the classic Dirty Dozen slash Suicide Squad trope. It's better than those setups. Suicide Squad is just, hey, you convicted criminals on death row, do this impossible job or else. That works and can absolutely be fun, but the fact that the worms mean we belong to this cult gives us so many cool storytelling moments, so many great moments of interaction. But that's not all. The worms also grant you power. The worms can do things psionic things. Suddenly, your character has a special talent. Did I mention the talent is out now? Our custom psionics class for fifth edition? It is a big hit. I think you would like it. Check out the link below. You could easily give your players talent powers if you want to do the brain worm thing in your game. It's perfect for it. Anyway, this is the third thing the worms do. They are mind flayer worms. That's bad. But they grant you extraordinary psionic powers. That's good. But the more you use the power, the more you depend on it. That's bad. But the power might help you defeat the Mind Flayers. That's good. What is that? It's drama. We are suddenly walking around with a moral quandary inside our heads. Some party members might be like, fuck yeah, man, use the worm. Use it, yeah. Do it. Do it. Do it. <laughs> for, for some players, leave that in. For some players, it's not a quandary, just... These worms are cool, come on, who cares? Let's just stick our huge throbbing brains into other people's defenseless squishy brains. <laughs> but that itself, not caring and just using the brain power like any other tool, is an interesting and dramatic choice. That's why the worms are good. These are good worms. They give us an excuse for PCs who would absolutely never work together to work together, but it's deeper than the classic Dirty Dozen Suicide Squad plot because the worms mark us as members of an enemy cult. Tons of cool opportunities for interactions, cool missions. You can try stealthing your way through their stronghold. And when you inevitably get caught, you can say, hey, we're in the same cult. We belong here, same as you. Then the worms give us these crazy powers, but we know they're evil. Do we use them? 
If so, how do we justify it? So you don't have to use a plot like this in your game. Again, it's up to you. What kind of game do you want to run? What kind of game do your players like to play? But there's an awful lot of good ideas here to rip off. Remember the rule, it's your game. Put the stuff you like in it. If you think the brain worms are cool, just steal them. Yeah, literally the same idea. You could just stick it in your game. So what if your players already know Baldur's Gate 3? Guess what? That means they will like the brain worms because now they get to play it for real and they already know how it works. But you could tweak it a little. I think that's the secret to running anything your players already know, a setting, an adventure. You need to take it and make it yours by changing it somehow. So everyone knows, oh, this is our version of this place or this adventure or these brain worms or whatever. First of all, the biggest, easiest change you could make is to switch up the bad guys. You could easily just switch out the mind flayers for beholders or aboleths, or use their much more interesting and fun to run cousins, the voiceless talkers, or the Olathek. Yeah, these guys are well creepy. These guys are all in Flea Mortals, which is out now. Or maybe it's a cult to an ancient evil dragon. Maybe the powers you're granted are more like dragon powers. Now, the worms are a little trickier to replace. Tricky, but not impossible. The worms are in your literal brain, so they give you psionic powers. Like from the talent, yeah. But let's use the dragon cult example. What if it's the tip of one of this evil elder dragon's claws implanted into your chest and it's growing and it's clutching at your heart? It gives you dragon powers, but it's killing you. Or it could be grosser. It could be more like the xenomorph egg from Alien. You've got one of these eggs incubating inside you and sooner or later, it will birth a xenomorph, killing you in the process. But in the meantime, you can walk around the alien base and the monsters there will treat you like you belong. Remember Frodo and the Morgul knife, right? The Nazgul stabbed Frodo with a haunted weapon and a piece of the weapon is left inside him. Well, we can imagine a powerful undead cult where this piece of the Morgul blade is worming its way closer and closer to your heart. And when it gets there, you will become a wraith, an eternal servant of the cult. But in the process, you're gaining more power, power over death. You can see into the world of the dead. You can call upon powers there, raise skeletons and zombies, maybe even enter the world of the dead. The cult's stronghold is full of undead, but they all treat you like one of them. In Baldur's Gate, the cult of the absolute is full of mostly willing people. They like the power the worms give them. But here, in the cult of rot, the cultists are all dead as you will soon be, and they remember their past lives in this really heartbreaking way. And maybe the low-level zombies and ghouls regret the choice they made. But then you meet higher-level undead who like the fact that they're immortal now, just as you will be. Who's in charge of this cult? Probably a lich? Or like a consortium of liches? What about the ultra-lich? Hang on, I should write this down. Whatever. You don't need to steal this plot, but if you do, go with what inspires you. You might think, well, my idea isn't as cool as those. Yes, it is. If any of this inspires you, whatever you come up with will be even cooler because it's your idea. Anyway, that's it, folks. I think Baldur's Gate 3 is a major work. I think Astarion might be the best NPC I've ever met in a game. And we might see another video or two talking about some other cool stuff from the game. I think there is a ton of amazing stuff to rip off. And the good news is these folks already did all the work. You can just steal it and stick it in your game. I'm sure most of you know MCDM is developing its own original RPG from scratch. It is a heroic fantasy game, but it is not a D20 clone. You can come by the MCDM channel and watch the game being developed live. We are going to crowdfunding on this project pretty soon, and we hope you will come along. There is a link below you can click on if you want an alert when the campaign goes live. We are hugely excited about this game. We think this is gonna be amazing. Already tons of cool stuff happening in playtesting, lots of stories to tell. We think we're making something you'll like. Click on the link below to get an alert. That's it for now, folks. New videos up on the MCDM channel and a new video here soon, soon, pretty soon. We'll see. Stay tuned. Until next time, peace out.